want to share a little bit. Thank you. I wanted to share a little bit about Vanessa before we jump in. And you might have seen this a little bit in the bio that I posted, but uh, Vanessa is a parent empowerment coach who knows for her, is known for her refreshingly honest, hands-on and personal approach. I can attest to that. Vanessa empowers parents to find the calm, confidence and tools that they need to address challenging behaviors such as meltdowns, power struggles, sibling fights, and motivation issues. She helps families shift painful dynamics so that love can flow more freely between family members while they build resilient, lifelong relationships based on respect, appreciation, and love. Vanessa, you're also the founder of Raising Our Resilience, your Facebook group and your program that draws upon 15 years of classroom experience and your educational research background in positive psychology, Montessori, motivation, child development, and resilience, all at UC Berkeley. You also bring your life experience as a step parent and caregiver, member of the LGBTQ community and mixed race person of color to create a safe, supportive, shame-free learning environment. You're just a badass. <laughs> you work with clients in one-on-one -on -one private coaching as well as year-long program. And, and I know you have so many trainings that you do in and out of that. So clearly you, uh, you have the skills and I'm just so thrilled that you're here to share it with us because we do have a lot of parents who are also in the pause world because I think our worlds do co they, they cross a lot in terms of intentional shifts in behavior and what needs to be done, right? So I know you've got a pulse on what seems to be the biggest challenges these days with parents. Can we start there and just like, like kind of where are we at in general? Yeah. Like, what's going on right, now? Let's, right, let's have some real talk here, friends. Um, and first of all, I want to say too, like uh, there to me, um, you know, high achieving women who also have children often want to be high achieving parents. And so, you know, a lot of times when we come up, come again, up, up against challenges like the ones I'm about to share with you, um, you know, all these tools are so useful that Rachel has been sharing with you in this, you know, um, sisterhood, but I also a lot of it translates to parenting. So if you just by being interested in what Rachel does, you're already on your path. I just want to acknowledge that. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> and um, because they're so trans skills are so transferable. I mean, it's really about leadership, self management, your personal resilience. Um, that's the starting place. Yeah, but um, what I'm hearing from parents is that as the world is opening up, there's just a lot of transitions coming up. So, you know, whether that's figuring out what the new morning routine is now that school's out and they're going to be traveling. So, how do we make sure the kid gets rest, the kid gets up, that we have like smooth mornings no matter where we are for some of the folks who are traveling. Others, it's like, what? how do we help our kid now socialize again? Because they've been kind of stuck in one household, you know, together. Um, but something that's like always going on around, um, you know, some of the pain points, like things that are just sort of leave you with maybe feeling exhausted or stressed or you know, even guilty at the end of the day is when kids have really big emotions come up and whether it's because you've asked something to do and they don't want to do it. So now they're throwing a tantrum or in a power struggle, or maybe they didn't get what they wanted from, from a friend. And then they, they you know, get a call that like, oh my gosh, my kid hit this other kid because they didn't know what to do with their anger. Like, it seems like what, what keeps happening, what I'm seeing is that when, when kids have big emotions, parents are often stuck and not really knowing what to say and what to do to help their kids have the skills and strategies and tools to be able to cope with those big emotions. So that's like a big one, that's a big piece. Um, and if you can relate to that, please say something in the chat or the comments um, of this video. So we know, you know, we'll, we'll that you're, yeah, same here, I relate to that. And maybe you can let us know like how old your kids are in one particular like kind of emotion or situation that comes up that's particularly challenging. So we can respond to that in this talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you're not alone is what I'm I'm hearing out there. And and you have the experience in them, I guess, is just like you're hearing from all ends what is going on right now. And it is a time of transition. I I'm and like whether you're a parent or not is, is what I know we've just all been through in the last 18 months and, and it continues. And that big emotional landscape is like all the more big, I'd say, right? And just present with all of us as we are more, we usually are with our, our families more and we're learning how to be with each other and around ourselves in different environments. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like for the experience of the parent right now, there can be quite a bit of um, 
like a sense of grief even of like losing a year, like your child, like losing a year of regular socializing or regular time with family or regular school even. Um, so we're working through that grief of that loss. We're also feeling some anxiety around like, well, what what is it going to look like? Is my kid behind now? Is there, what, what can I do? How do I how do I establish a new normal when we come back to in-person school? Or if you've been in in-person school, like how do we navigate masking and not masking or visiting relatives who haven't been vaccinated? Like there's just so many factors that we just haven't really had to deal with before. And I literally feel like we've been in a resilience test. And what, I, what, I'm, what brings me hope and um, you know perspective around this um, personally, and as someone who's working with families is that because it's anytime you're tested, it's an opportunity to find out what your strengths are and also an opportunity to find out like, where could I use some more tools and skills? And so in some ways, this has been an amplifier. It's been an amplifier of our personal strengths, of our parenting strengths. It's also been an amplifier of some spaces and in, in ways that we could learn, learn some new tools and tricks. And how human of us, right? To be like, life is in session. We're human beings in progress and <laughs> process. We're always you know, needing to um, learn and adapt as our kids, especially as kids grow up. So we have our world situation and then our kids are also evolving and changing all the time and we're keeping up with that. So I just might have a big, <laughs> let me, if I could, I'd wrap you up in a big old like empathy hug right now, everyone out there who can relate yeah. to any struggles because it, the struggle's real. Like it's not something we're making up or we shouldn't have to, we shouldn't be, we should be stronger about or something like it's just happening. <laughs> it's just happening. It's just coming and happening. And it's part of where we are right now in our world. And, um, and I think it takes a tremendous amount of courage to, to be in this game right now with, with our world and, and as a parent and navigating. So, um, you know, the work that you're doing is so important. And I think a lot of parents kind of like you were saying earlier, think they're, they have to do it alone. And that's similar in the, in the pause world, because I think, we just think we got to figure it out or <clears throat> we're doing what we can with what we know, but there's so much more potentially that we could learn or, or, or grab it or like get into so that we could serve not only us, but our kids. And then everyone else is a little better off. Yeah. Often I'll, you know, I know you draw a lot of high achievers into your world too, and we end up just having a lot more responsibilities too. And so you know, building in the pauses for ourselves and for our kids because we can tend to pack the schedule. We can tend to forget to take care of, put our own oxygen mask on. And then our kids can also start to get run a little ragged from, you know, filling things up too quickly. So mm -hmm. I think um, this is a great opportunity. I would call it an opportunity for us to more deliberately and intentionally kind of design our daily life with kids. Um, a lot of the folks who are coming to me right now are saying, Vanessa, help me with the routines. You know, help me like figure out what my kid can do independently, what I can expect of them, how to run things more smoothly. So when I drop them off in the fall to school, we're not looking like we just already had a 12 hour day because we, it was like, I had to remind them so many times, there's all the stress, we were rushed, they were trying to do too much at once or whatever, it's disorganized. Like help me get organized around that. For example, you know, it's just, um, again, leaning into the idea of an opportunity here. Like what if we get to very intentionally design like our routines and establish, reestablish our kind of like our family values and expectations and rules and boundaries. So it's, a, it's a shift, it's a shift, right? It's like life happened to us, like, oh, all these circumstances, but now we get to like be the creators, which is- Right, right. And, and so let's get into that. Cause there's so much, there's so much to, to learn, I think from you. And you were talking about this is a time of transitions and just in like navigating our ways to to use coping tools. So can you share maybe a couple? I know like I would love to learn some myself because maybe they're even like can people do them who aren't parents too? Oh, for sure, hundred percent. This is like just as this is just good for humans, right? Yeah, so, human tools, great. Yeah, anytime we're focusing on like what's good for kids, we can kind of like we can, you know, basically backfill if we didn't get these tools as kids and have them now, like it's never too late, right? So even if you're not, um, you know, a person with children in your care, um, these tools are great. So, I mean, the first thing is that like, in terms of resilience mapping, like um, I've determined seven main areas that really help us all to have more resiliency. And um, the one I already mentioned was, you know, these robust routines and 
I know that your work, Rachel, often helps parents build in the pause, you know, parents it helps all folks who are in your world build in that pause into their routine. And you gave some really specific great advice to my parents um, last month. We really, like yeah. I got some feedback on, people were like, oh, that was so helpful. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be long. Like you could just fit it in. Um, so building in into your routines, um, self-care, like it has to be there. And um, and finding specific ways to get your kids on board with what the routines are, using like what we know about how people learn. And one hot tip I can give you is that if you actually take the time to lay out what it is, then you then you have a, like a reference point, right? So oftentimes we're just like chasing down the tasks like, oh yeah, this, oh yeah, this, oh yeah, that. But we just take like, it can take 10 minutes and just sort of like, what are the things that are absolutely necessary every morning to get done either with life with children or life without children, right? Like what are they? And what what is like the most agreeable order to do them in that actually makes sense and feels good? And then with the children, it, a big question you're gonna ask, so this is with the kids, um, what, which of these do I think they could truly do independently and which of these do they actually need my support to be mm -hmm. successful in? And when you get really real about that question, you can have some breakthroughs around your routines. So that's one pillar. Yeah. So yeah. checklists, I'm hearing checklists, like get a, get a, get a list of do's and then get them out of your brain so that you can empty that mental space almost to feel a little more relaxed. And I can tell you from my experience, I'm not a parent, but I, I parent myself a lot. <laughs> and I, uh, I think checklists are one of my main go-tos. I love, I love them. Yeah. So I'm glad this is a tool you, you you've been able to incorporate Rachel. And I feel like there's something special about um, creating that with your child if you have a child in your life as well so that they can see that modeled of like, oh, you can you can write it out. And what what's really cool about establishing new habits is that it can take 10 to sometimes 20 weeks, right, to establish a new habit. Um, but if you, you know, if you stick with it, it can become internalized where you don't even need the checklist anymore. Like now, when I walk into the kitchen, I immediately take out my vitamins and I, and I take them because it's something that I decided needed to be in my routine. I would attach it to this event of walking into the kitchen as my first thing I do when I get into the kitchen. And now I don't need to have a list, a checklist to remember to, to like realize I've done it. I just do it now. So you can go from checklist to practice kind of in the lab of life. And then it just becomes sort of muscle memory and flow. And even like sort of the sense of mastery of like, oh, I, I know how to do my vitamin thing in the morning. I'm, I've got this down. <laughs> so that's what's possible. I heard it takes 33 days to create any new habit for an adult. And I'm wondering, like for kids, it's probably different, but it's still like, you know, even to make it stick, it takes long. So that's the kind of time frame we really need, do need. But we can we can change our routines and it matter and it's okay. important. Yeah, and there's a there's a really big variable there too, which is did you did you design the routine or did some did you design the habit or did someone design it for you? So big difference in motivation in the first place to even get on board with it, you know. So how, involving the child, getting their you know getting their input into how it can go can be really helpful. Or co-designing, right? So I've I have sat with parents in our collaborative document and like in their coaching sessions and just like we hammered out an outline. And getting a chance for the parents to also like have a thought partner, like they do with, I'm sure all of your clients have done with you, Rachel, at some point is like, let's look at your day. Like, how are you running your, how are you running your ship, right? Um, you can yeah. do that with kids too, right? So so like what 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 I've seen over and over again is that when parents get mentorship or or you know, for you, like if it's if it's moms and or just high achieving women get that mentorship you get a model of the process and then you get to go do that with like your team members at work or your co-parent or your children. And it's like a template for success. So there's so many layers here, but I think, yeah, starting with that checklist. Getting checklist clear, is good. You know, what else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, another one is, um, you know, when you're, when you're wanting to establish a new boundary or, or set up an expectation, like, a lot of us had to, for example, caregivers establish that when we leave the house, we wear masks. And that wasn't easy at first, but then finally the kids adapted and adopted, right? They adapted to the new norm and then they adopted it as something. So we can see how this works, yeah? Um, so having healthy boundaries and clear expectations is one of the, like the, like the core pillars. And um, one of the things you always wanna do is make sure 
that you're really clear about what it is in terms that the kid can understand. So here's an example. You might say things like, I expect you to clean up your room before you come to dinner. And that's pretty clear. Like at least you, you, know, you know when it is, you know what the task is overall. Yeah. But your idea of what clean your room means and what their idea of clean your room could be completely different things. <laughs> right? How do you do? So yeah. So then yeah. What? Yeah, so there's this phrase that's uh, I borrowed from positive discipline, but I've just used so many times in the classroom when my clients are using all the time, you know, we, whether they're in my year long program in the immersion or in a private, you know, private, private client, they're um, take time, take time out for training. So take a little time to actually train your kids and like, what did, what is this expectation? And maybe there's even some gaps that they have that you need to fill, like, you can walk into a room and notice there are 20 things on the floor. They can walk into the room and beeline straight through that, straight through those 20 things to their Lego set and not even like, it's not even in their world. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so yeah. Take some, you could even train like, like to, to notice and even like take stop, like check the floor could be part of the training. Like check the floor. Is there anything on the floor? So that could be on a checklist. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I love the idea too of like, walking through it with them, right? Like, like do it side by side and, and train them as you go. Like, how do you, like, where does this go? Is it clean or dirty? And then it goes in the dirty pile. Like things we take for granted that they just know how to do. They Can I ask you a follow-up to that? Cause yeah. this is, this is like my childhood that I remember. Like what if your kid whines or puts up like the meltdown or just like has you in their crux, you know, and they're, and, and like, what do, what do you, what can you do at that point? What's the best approach? Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, it's a big one. It's good. So I would be looking at where they, you know, did you, did you find a way to get them on board with it in the first place? Like, have you made an attempt to help to them get their buy-in <laughs> Get their buy -in and like have them influence how it goes even like, well, do you want, would you rather pick up your clothes first or your toys first? You know, giving them choices, giving them, letting them kind of run the show as much as possible um, while you hold your expectation. If the big emotions come up, I mean, that's a whole nother piece that is one of the pillars to seven is emotional resilience, emotional mastery, right? So how, what, what, what are my options as a parent when my child is upset? You know, you can emotion coach them, you can give them a little space and time. You can offer them a coping tool or strategy. You can um, also, you know, just let it go this time and know that you didn't do, maybe you didn't take enough time out for training. Maybe you didn't, you know, get their input enough. So you're going to try that first before you attempt to get them to do the thing again. So there's all these ways, these nuances, I would say my number one go-to is to like, make sure you don't, you're not fighting with the feelings because you can't say like, well, you shouldn't be mad about this or you should be right. sad. About this. Like, like, oh. that, yeah. I know this one too, from my training and just like experience, and that um, anytime we just say like, don't like, you're not feeling this way. It's you're you're not validating the person. And it's, it just leads to not ever feeling seen or heard. And that just feels challenging, hurtful. Oftentimes it'll just, yeah, it'll, it'll like cause more hurt. And then you're just in deeper and maybe right. escalating things. <laughs> like I don't know where they are, right? Well, I don't know where they're at and where you're at. Uh, yeah. So there's this, there's this whole body of work out there that, okay, I'd love to share if, if we have time. There's like yeah, let's do it. Minute. So what we're finding in the research is that it's a blend between the two. So mm -hmm. when you're validating an emotion, that's like very supportive, but that doesn't then mean not hold the line on an important life lesson or important boundary. So to sum that up, it's like supportive and demanding at the same time. And that's the blend that a lot of us didn't grow up with. We grew up with one or the other or an absent parent. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, but when those two things are there together, when you can be both supportive, demand, supportive and demanding, and you add in an infusion of warmth, so you're like doing it in a, like a warm and calm way, which is part of why I have a calm parent training <laughs> coming up, and um, you know a webinar on like how to navigate these big emotions because this is not this is not something you can snap your fingers and just know how to do, right? right. But when you get there, kids get to have so much like. So warm, supportive, and demanding parents tend to have children who have better friendships, higher GPAs, mm. higher level of life satisfaction. And this is sometimes, this is asking middle schoolers, high schoolers, and adults to reflect back. And the ones who can say, my parents, I knew I, I, knew I was loved, I knew I was supported, 
and they had high expectations of me. They tend to achieve their goal, the goals they set out to do. So they, that's part of that life satisfaction. They also in adolescence have less anxiety, less depression, <laughs> less likely to drop out of school, less likely to engage in risky, unhealthy behavior, more likely to have to exhibit great critical thinking skills, to really go for their goals and be sort of internally motivated um, to strive, yeah? So it's like, we actually do, the good news is we have influence here, right? So if we can bring in a supportive, demanding and warm style and tend to things like routines and boundaries and like, what do we do with big emotions? Three of the seven pillars, for example, they get to, we get to set up our kids for success, like in this like, very, very well known way, right? And if things go, things go sideways, it's like, well, we know we did what we could, right? Yeah. So at the, at the end of the day, I'm at peace of mind. Thanks for sharing that research because I think that just hits home why this work really matters as as a human and as a parent because you can make a difference and it's not set in stone. And what you learned as a kid doesn't mean it has to stay the same. Like you can bring in new skills and learn them. And that's what's so cool about what you're doing. So thank you for sharing that. And I put it in the chat, I put a little research blurb in there. Um, and all right, so we've got two of the two of the, the things. We've got the list, we've got um, expectations and boundary setting with empathy. Uh, what would you say would be a third tip or, or tool that we can help to navigate these, these, these emotionals? Yeah, well, and I also want to just notice that the first two were a lot about like being proactive, right? So if you've got that, if you've got the kid on board and learn, really learning the routine and really going smoothly, like you get to avoid those big upsets, a lot, a lot of those big upsets in the first place. And then the boundaries one is another one. Like if you're really clear and upfront about your expectations and you're, then you help and take time out for training for them to meet those expectations. Again, you're getting ahead of the problem, right? So those are the two. Now, if you're in the moment and it's happening anyway, I actually will say, piggyback on your great work, Rachel, and say, helping build in that pause to bring in more awareness is huge. And you were mentioning validating emotions. Well, a version of that is taking a moment to say like, look, you look really upset, right? You know, like you're actually pausing to acknowledge that there's an emotion happening, <laughs> right? Acknowledging their experience and building in that pause. So we can do that for them by just literally dropping in and empathizing and helping them name what's going on. And it doesn't have to be a 20 minute thing. It can be 10 seconds to two minutes. Yeah. Just helping them make sense of their experience, right? So that's the emotion coaching piece that's in that pause. But sometimes to even get them into that moment, you have to do something that really uses your senses. So one pro tip I have is help them notice the sensations in their body that they're experiencing, right? Like, Okay, it seems like your breathing is really fast. I see your chest going up and down. Your face is really red. You're clenching your fists. I see tears. Your feet, you're kind of doing this with your mouth. Kind of tells me maybe you're sad. So we can harness our senses and our ability to tune into our bodies to create that pause, to bring to, to, which, which allows that awareness to come in. So you're not just stuck in the emotion and cycling through like, you know, what whatever thought is stuck in your head or whatever motion you're making, which can happen for kids. We get stuck. That's huge. I love that. Yeah. What a great tip N using our senses. So like, what do we see? What do we feel? What are we hearing? What are we looking at? What are we smelling? Like anything like that can be so helpful because it's, it gets us out of my, my understanding is it gets us out of our uh, subjective mind because those are, that's like data, right? Like you're like noticing like the red cheeks and it's not like, you are you you feel sad don't you like it's so different you know it's like that's an that's a that's a total judgment of them and they might be but if i'm just saying their cheeks are red they might be like oh yeah like they are red I'm like what am i doing <laughs> you know like i don't know it just seems so yeah. helpful yeah so to tune into it you know and and what it builds up it builds up this awareness so that they start we start hopefully you know the idea is that with enough reps right like with anything you practice it enough they can start to do that for themselves. How am I feeling? I think I'm feeling, I think I'm, ups I think I'm feeling uncomfortable right now. Like that, what a great tool to have, right? How should, cool would that be? <laughs> right? Or like, I'm upset. I should probably walk away and cool down first. Like, and I've seen it. So I, in the classroom, I had kids from six to nine and I'd have kids come in at six 
blowing up all of you, like just lots of fire, lots of temper, lots of, you know, emotion and working with them for three years over that time, which parents, we have the opportunity to work with our kids for forever. Um, you get to see them internalize that and actually start to notice how they're like, actually notice how like, ask themselves that what could be going on here for me? And maybe I'm sad. I'm going to go over to a feelings chart and see which one makes sense to me or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ask a friend for some help or do the coping tool. So creating that pause for them with uh, using their senses, it helps get out of the subjective mind, like Rachel was mentioning, helps them get back into the, into like what's true, what, what their experience is. And then um, occasionally it's also like, we just need to like actually distract ourselves and redirect our attention away from like whatever the trigger was, whether it's the a thought you're having over and over or um, you're a, near, near a person who's upsetting you or you're in a crowd and that's too, you know overwhelming, you can take some time away from that and just pause in that sense and kind of just notice, okay, I took, I stepped out of the crowd. I'm just gonna, like a, a client of mine just did this and reported him back this morning. They said, it really worked. We were in this crowded situation. She started to get upset dragged, you know, pulled her out and had her just look for everything that's red around her. Yeah. Slides red, that leaf is red, that car is red. And she totally calmed down. It worked. And she's, he's like, it felt like a magic trick. I'm like, well, you're just engaging, engaging the mind to focus on somewhere else on things that are just plain facts, like you said, true. And give your brain a break from maybe cycling that ruminating thought or yeah. that subjective experience over and over again, re-triggering yourself. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a great tip. And I'm one, one we can also apply to ourselves. And I know you've got some, some exciting things on the on your calendar coming up to help others with training and speaking of, of which even tomorrow. So so this is Friday. So 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 June, what is it, the 12th? Yeah, yeah the 12th. We've got a webinar coming up. Can you share about that? And I'll put it yeah. And, and I just want to say too, if folks, if you want, if it's after the, the webinar, you can still register and see the replay all replay available. Cool. Yeah. Um, so it's called navigating meltdowns, tantrums and power struggles with more calm and confidence. And we're going to go even deeper into the science behind what happens in our brains when we have these big emotions so that we can make sense of the experience and we can help our kids do the same. Um, so if you have anybody in your world who has kids, who you know could use some tools and strategies around big emotions. Like I, I create a very, very easy, easygoing, shame-free environment. Um, so it's not like, oh, I have, you need parenting advice kind of to share. It's more like there's this person I met, you know, I, I heard and she's got these great tools and strategies. I loved her insights, check this out. So please do share and pass on. It's a free webinar and we'll be getting started tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific. Cool. So you heard it here first. We've got the links in the chat. It's the um, three keys to navigate meltdowns. You, you can be there live. You could ask questions, even if you had them, like potentially, or just like follow up. And also, if you can't go live, I'm hearing you can watch the replay, which is great. That's right. That's so exciting. Yeah. And then the other thing, I know you've got a group that we can all join to learn more about upcoming events and tips that you've got and all this great research that you share, where can we find you out there on the interwebs? Yeah, <laughs> um, I have a group called Raising Our Resilience Parents. And so it's um, an opportunity, like I go live, like, like Rachel does once a week and um, share out tips. I've got a bunch of great videos there and strategies that you can, you know, go ahead and scroll through and find some things that speak to you. Um, yeah, and we have like over 600 parents who want to raise resilient kids and even just being around other folks, you know, working on similar goals can be so motivating and give us that little lift we need when we've had a rough day with the kids. Yeah, that's the thing. Like we all need support and, and like no one can do it alone, especially parents. And even if you're, even if you're co-parenting with someone in the same household, my sense is like, you still need support. It's not just about you and this other person doing stuff. Like we just, we always need more than we know. And the best thing is to get it before you really need it. Like, like get it so that you're feeling you can do whatever you need to do and have that that backbone of what you need to to be resilient really it's absolutely i'm all about rebuilding the village like that's how we evolve like that's that's those are our roots that's where we came from and you know in the village you have peers to to study with or to swap ideas with and you have mentors and people who've walked who've already walked down the road that you're going down 
And it just makes so much sense to build that into our communities now. And it's such a gift in a way that we can do it virtually. And then, um, you know, be able to dip into these different sort of tribes or villages whenever we need it. And um, some people end up wanting to, you know, have a more formal mentorship relationship too, which is available. But it's just great to be able to, you know, at least, you know, check it out and have a chance to try on try on some things, see if it's mm -hmm. a good for you and your awesome. family. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to come by, stop by today in the in the pause tribe, our family, our um, our village. <laughs> and I so appreciate all of what you share, Vanessa. You've got amazing, incredible skills. And I'm just so glad to be like partnering with you and like helping you reach more parents that can help them be more resilient in the world. And, and uh, it all starts with them and awareness and the pause, like you said. So excited for that and, and all that you do. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Rachel. And I know you have a really special event coming up next week that people should absolutely check out. Like, yeah, yeah. So do you. <laughs> I do too, but you know, what, what's exciting, I think, about these multiple day events when I can just speak to it is that it's almost like you, you get to train your brain because you keep showing up and getting a new little piece. And then at, afterward, you know, it's, it's like you're in this um, practice of being curious and trying new tools and um, it just sort of enlivens, enlivens your own personal sort of development plan. I, I find, I you know, that. I've been to many of these kinds of multi-day things and it's, it's really powerful. So if you have a chance to tune into Rachel's next week, I highly recommend it. And she's always got such great science-based, you know, hacks and tools for us all. So Thank check you. it out. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, it's kind of like a little mini immersion you can jump into and, and try out a way of living that may not be your norm and then be like, oh yeah, this feels a little weird. Or I kind of think this could work over time. And, and um, yeah, I'm just excited to, to host that and offer that. And, and same to you, sister. I'm just excited for our journeys together as we continue to um, help, help raise resilience and help people really just thrive in the ways that they know that is possible. So yay us, like yay you. Thank you all for being here. And we'll see you next time and hopefully see you in the overwhelm fix next week here on the be the pause channel bye everybody bye everybody have a great one